Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> that was really nice. Thank you. So in the past couple of months, people have been frequently asking me, how did you first get interested in math and science? So the answer that I usually say is from watching Bill Nye the Science Guy or Mythbusters. Yeah, yeah I love them. <laughs> but the longer answer, the real answer, is in an ice cream shop when I was seven. So being an adventurous and ice cream obsessed seven-year-old, when I found out that an ice cream store had opened up nearby, I begged my dad to take me there that very weekend. So there I was, saving a scoop of triple chocolate ice cream, when my dad, attempting to strike up a conversation with his seven-year-old daughter, something he found terrifying back then and probably still does today, asked the least kid-friendly question possible. Do you know why manholes are round? <laughs> and so I say what any seven-year-old would say after, after being asked that question in mid-spoonful of ice cream. I don't know. And so my dad, being kind of a smart aleck and socially awkward, says, well, yeah, he is. If you did know, then why would I ask you? So why don't you think about it? So I started thinking about this question, and my mind goes completely blank. I don't know how to start, what the answer looked like, or what I was aiming for. So my dad, sensing that I was kind of confused, starts breaking down this question into a series of simpler questions. So he starts by asking me, so what other shapes could you have used? And I say, rectangles, triangles, and maybe even stars. And he says, he asks, well, what's the difference between circles and those shapes that you just listed? And I say, well, circles are round, and those shapes all have corners and edges. And so he asks, given that piece of information, why would I choose a circle over what you just listed? And so I say, and I get really excited because I think I've got the answer, and I, sh and I shout out, is it because circles are round, so no matter which way you place them, they always fit? But that's not necessarily true of these other shapes because they've got corners and edges. So unfortunately, this wasn't the answer my dad was looking for. And he went on to talk about this explanation with a bunch of tough math, physics, and science that I didn't understand until years later. But as I was tuning him out, I realized that this problem, <laughs> <laughs> that this problem that was virtually unknown to me like 10 minutes ago had been broken down into a series of smaller questions that I did know the answers to, and that eventually led me to an answer to this bigger problem. And so I credit this to being my first math and science lesson, as well as the first time I became interested in math and science, because I realized that math and science uses the same principle. The toughest, most intimidating, most challenging math and science questions can be broken down into multiple simple questions. And the thrill of acting like an archaeologist, taking something completely abstract and unknown, and being able to uncover the familiar pieces and parts thrilled me. So now flash forward to 2009, when I'm 14 years old. To say I was an uber nerd would, would have probably been an understatement. I'm proud to be on my school's math team, and I think that my fellow math nerds who talk nonstop about the physics behind jetpacks and time travel are the coolest people ever. And forget the Jonas Brothers, I was all about Pascal and Gauss. Sci <laughs> scientists and mathematicians were my rock stars. Pascal wrote a proof on um, conics that was oh so sexy. And, and Ian Donald may not have sold a million albums, but he did invent the ultrasound, which is now being used in thousands of hospitals. And at the same time, I'd always preferred reading Scientific American, Discovery Magazine, and Popular Science to actually watching science fiction movies, or just movies in general. I mean, sure, it's cool when you see the futuristic technology and science of Avatar on the big screen. But it's 10 times cooler when you see a more ingenious idea happening in real life. And tag on the fact that this ingenious idea or piece of research could potentially be saving lives. So it was this cooler than science fiction aspect of current research that compelled me and prompted me to contact professors at my local university. So surprisingly, not many responded to the 14-year-old girl's crazed desire to turn Star Trek into reality, but a couple did. And so I was so excited to get into the lab and get my hands on all of this fancy equipment that I'd been reading about in Discovery Magazine for the past couple of years. And a small part of me wanted to go all mad scientist and act like Dr. Frankenstein and create this alter being that would test the morals of society. <laughs> but unfortunately, the reality couldn't have been farther from what I had imagined. My professor kind of handed me the stack of science research articles and said, why don't you read this? And then when you're done with that, we'll talk about all that. And he like, left with this malicious laugh. So I look at the stack of papers, and I think, I've been reading Scientific American since I was 12, and I just aced my last biology test. So I'll be done with this reading in no time, and I'll be working in the lab. 
So I start reading the article and I highlight words that I don't know. This is what my article looked like when I was done. Nearly every single word, except for maybe the prepositions, had been highlighted. I knew absolutely nothing. Microscopy, immunofluorescence, polyethnoglycol, it really was a foreign language. And the sheer magnitude of everything I didn't know intimidated me. I thought I would be spending the next 10 years of my life just gaining a basic comprehension of that one page. And the fear of not knowing how to start, how to begin, how to approach this led me to believe that I'd be spending the next 10 years of my life just reading this article. And so I thought this would be my first and last stop in my science research adventure. However, I went back to basics, something I'd been relying on for the past couple of years, which is taking something unknown and breaking it down into simpler, simpler problems. And so I went line by line, and I checked off words that I did know, and, I, and looked up concepts and words that I didn't know. And so I worked line by line, paragraph by paragraph, page by page, and I read the whole article. And I spent the first year in that lab not reading the article, I, I mean, not in the lab, but instead in a cubicle reading these articles. But it did, in fact, prove to be effective because at the end of a year, an article that had previously taken maybe a week to read now only took a couple of hours. And so after I was reading these articles, I started gaining an understanding that not only allowed me to ask the big questions, but also get some answers. And so the biggest question by far that I had was, how far away are we from definitively winning this war against cancer? And so this question was unique because unlike previous math and science questions that had left my mind completely blank, this question left my mind exploding with answers that I had been reading about in these science research articles. There were so many possible answers, and even a couple that contradicted each other, that it was extremely difficult to come up with a single definitive answer. So I went back to basics again, and I started breaking that, down that question into multiple simpler questions. But instead, this time, I wasn't breaking down the unknown, I was organizing what I did know. And so questions that I started asking were like, what current treatments do we have? And um, what challenges do these treatments face? And how do we translate breakthrough research into human applications now? And so as I, was, as I was asking myself these questions, I started to realize I couldn't come up with a solution to all of these questions. Brilliant scientists before me had been working on these problems for years, and probably dozens more will in the future. But what I could do, what I found more thrilling and exciting than discouraging, was that I could work on a corner of this million piece cancer puzzle. What I could do is I could take this huge problem of cancer, break it down into smaller pieces, smaller problems, sub-problems, sub and then reduce that even more and focus on the problems that I thought I could tackle. And so the three problems I chose to tackle were first, targeting cancer stem cells, the perpetrated cause of tumor growth, drug resistance, and cancer recurrence. Second, minimizing the toxicity to healthy cells in order to improve patient quality of life during treatment. And then third, real-time imaging of, um, of the treatment. And so these three problems led to this project, which is an iron oxide gold dumbbell nanoparticle. It's about 30 to 50 nanometers in diameter. So to give you guys a frame of reference, your strand of hair is probably 100,000 nanometers in diameter. So this is an incredibly, incredibly small nanoparticle. Now, my nanoparticle has three main functions. So the first function is that it specifically targets cancer cells. And so how it does this is that, hold on here, it's going to get really scientific, but I'll explain it. So this iron oxide nanoparticle is coated with this peptide that specifically targets biomarkers that are overexpressed on many cancer and cancer stem cells. So what this essentially means is that this nanoparticle only binds to cancer and cancer stem cells and leaves normal cells relatively unharmed. And so the second characteristic of my nanoparticle is that this gold nanoparticle is coated with this smart polymer that when it's heated up by a laser that's aimed at the tumor site, it causes the smart polymer to collapse, shrink, and therefore squeeze out the preloaded chemo drug directly at the tumor site. And so this localizes the cancer treatment directly at the cancer and doesn't hurt, harm the other healthy cells. And so a lot of the problems of current cancer treatments is that they kill normal cells in addition to cancer cells, leading to a very poor patient quality of life. So I'm almost done with this scientific stuff. So the third characteristic of my nanoparticle is its multimodality imaging properties. So the iron oxide and gold dumbbell nanoparticle can act as conscious agents for multiple imaging tools, which is something revolu revolutionary. It can act as conscious agents for MRI imaging, photoacoustical, and even Raman imaging. 
And so the overall goals of my nanoparticle is just to personalize cancer um, medicine so that it improves the efficacy of the treatment as well as it improves the patient quality of life during treatment. So in a nutshell, what I did is I just took this huge problem and I broke it down and I broke that down even further to something that I thought it could solve. And so as teenagers, we have unparalleled passion to tackle on the most intimidating, most challenging problems of our society. But too often, we're discouraged by the idea of how do we proceed and this is so overwhelming, how am I going to finish all of this? But I truly believe that if that seven-year-old kid who is sitting in the ice cream shop who could barely answer those questions about manholes, that you too can use that principle of breaking down things to achieve the incredible as well. Thank you.